Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another CAS webinar. Tonight, we have space news from Roy Bryce. Then our main speaker for this evening is David Ramshaw, whose presentation is entitled Special Relativity Explained for the Layman with Practical Applications in Astronomy. Our next webinar is on the 22nd of February, when our speaker is Paul Money, whose presentation is entitled, Why Are There No Green Stars? Now it's over to Roy for Space News. Good, okay, thank you, Alison. And the hey is the usual, just set up the shared screen. Mm. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> What's that noise? <laughs> no idea. Meant to be there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Just taking a second or two to get the PowerPoint to work. I can't see my PowerPoint yet. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, there it is. Right. So, uh, that's that thing where you need to press the button down here first as well. Right, I think we're good to go. So, the search for planets out with the solar system, known as exoplanets, has had one significant limitation. We can only find exoplanets that exist right now. But our universe has been hanging around for over 13 billion years. In many generations of planetary systems have come and gone in that vast expanse of cosmic time. Unfortunately, when stars die, they usually take their planets with them. But as a new research paper has pointed out, that doesn't remove all the evidence of the planetary system off the galactic map. If any planets survive, they can occasionally gravitationally scatter off one another. This doesn't usually happen in stable systems, but in the death throes of a star, anything's possible. Some of those scattered objects can head inwards to the white dwarf, the leftover core of the parent star. That white dwarf is made of almost completely pure carbon and oxygen, surrounded by a dense but thin shell of hydrogen and helium. Naturally, any object passing too close will get torn to shreds by the extreme gravity of the white dwarf, with the debris making its way to the surface to mix and mingle with the hydrogen and helium. Once there, any elements in the destroyed object, like lithium or calcium, can release their own light, giving a spectral fingerprint that astronomers can potentially spot. Most white dwarfs are too hot though, and that light outshines any contamination. But the recent Gaia mission was able to map dozens of old, cool white dwarves. And astronomers have detected the distinct signature of crushed up planets in their atmospheres. The astronomers found that the abundance of enriched elements matches what we know from our own solar system, indicating that planetary systems like ours have been in the universe for a very, very long time. Venus may not have had Earth-like tectonic plates or volcanism for the last billion years, according to a new study. A deep look at a giant impact crater on Venus suggests <clears> that the planet hasn't experienced any tectonic activity in the recent past. It might be covered in a single outer plate. If so, somebody's coughing, if you could, if it might be Robert, can you meet yourself, please? If so, this would essentially rule out any recent volcanic activity on the planet that may consider, or many consider, Earth's twin. Researchers from Brown University studied Venus's largest impact basin, Mead Crater. Yep, somebody wanted to join, hold on a second, just let them in. The basin was created by a large object that smashed into Venus between 300 million and 1 billion years ago, leaving a crater more than 170 miles in diameter. Mead is surrounded by two cliff-like faults which appear as rocky ripples that have remained unchanged over time. Using computer models, the researchers found that for those rings to be where they are in relation to the central crater, Venus's lithosphere, or the rocky outer shell, must have been quite thick, 
certainly far thicker than that of Earth. This tells us that Venus probably had what we'd call a stagnant lid at the time of the impact, said a graduate student from Brown's. Unlike Earth, which has an active lid with moving plates, Venus appears to be in a one-plate planet for at least as far back as this impact. On Earth, most of the world's volcanoes are found around the edges of tectonic plates, both on land and in the oceans. About 80 to 90% of all volcanic eruptions occur when the plates move under another or where they spread apart. Venus is a difficult planet to study due to its thick atmosphere, which obscures views of the surface. However, NASA's Magellan mission was able to map Venus's surface using cloud penetrating radar. While radar images show more than a thousand volcanic structures on the planet, for the most part, they appear to be ancient and inactive. Magellan's data allowed scientists to conclude that the planet's volcanic surface has likely remained unchanged over the past several hundred million years. Other studies have pointed to plate tectonics being a possibility in Venus its relatively recent past, such as a paper out in 2020 that concluded that Venus still had 37 volcanic structures that were possibly recently active. But the Brown University team said that the thick Venusian lithosphere means that Venus has been without plate tonics for as far back as a billion years. Alexander Evans, an assistant professor at Brown and the study's co-author, said that one compelling aspect of the findings from Reed is that a consistency with other features in Venus. Several other ring craters that the researchers looked at were all very similar to Mead. I think the finding further highlights the unique place that Earth and its system of global plate tectonics has amongst our planetary neighbours, Evan said in a press release. Please. So, let me change. Telescopes have captured meteoroids hitting the moon, and several spacecraft imaged Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 smacking into Jupiter in 1994. The impacts as they happen in another rocky world have never been observed. However, the MESSENGER mission may have seen an impact take place back in 2013. In looking at archival data from the mission, scientists found evidence of a meteoroid impact on Mercury. While this data isn't a, a no-doubt photo of the actual event, it does tell scientists more about impacts and how they affect Mercury's wispy thin atmosphere. Mercury's tiny atmosphere, called an exosphere, has a pressure that's one quadrillionth of that felt at sea level on Earth. The exosphere forms on Mercury's sun-facing side from material originally on the planet's surface. Scientists think that meteoroid impacts, in part, are responsible for putting such material into the exosphere. The archival data revealed a strange anomaly. On December the 21st, 2013, MESSENGER's fast imaging plasma spectrometer saw an unusually large number of sodium and silicon ions blowing in the sun's solar wind. The powerful gas charges, oops, gas charge stream that spews from the sun. Oddly, these particles were traveling in a tight beam, nearly all in the same direction and at the same speed. Using the particle's speed and direction, the researchers rewound the clock, tracking the particles motion back to their source. They found the particles clustered in a dense plume, one that had erupted from Mercury's surface and extended nearly 3,300 miles into space. They estimated the meteoroid was likely just a little over three foot long, which is relatively small. But computer models suggest that something that size would create a plume with a height and density closely matching what the FIPS detected. Interestingly enough, before the MESSENGER mission, Scientists expected the spacecraft would capture some impacts on Mercury, perhaps up to two impacts per year during its four years in orbit. But none were seen in images during the mission, which lasted from 2011 to 2015. But when they sifted through the old spectrometer data, this anomaly stood out. He said, it just shows how rare it is to have the spacecraft in the right place at the right time to be able to measure something like this. This was a special observation, and it was really cool to see the story coming together. Perhaps the European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo mission, which launched for Mercury in 2018 and will approach the planet in late 2025, 
we'll be able to capture more meteoroid actual impacts during its mission. According to new research that appeared in Nature Geoscience, the larger of Mars's two moons has an orbit that takes it through a stream of charged particles that flow from the red planet's atmosphere. This process has been taking place for billions of years as the planet slowly lost its atmosphere, effectively establishing a record of Martian climate change on Phobos's surface. This research has provided yet another incentive for landing a mission on Phobos, something that's never been done successfully. In essence, the mission could gather sample data that would allow scientists to study this record more closely. In the process, they would be able to, excuse me, I'm just admitting somebody else. In the process, they would be able to learn a great deal more about how Mars went from being a warmer world with liquid water to the extremely arid and cold environment it is today. According to the study, the Martian atmosphere began to lose slowly charged, to slowly lose charged particles to space ever since its magnetic field disappeared billions of years ago. This is how Mars became an extremely arid and freezing planet with an atmosphere of less than 1% that of Earth. Some of these ions impacted Phobos and could therefore be preserved in the uppermost layer of the Moon's surface. The researcher said, we know that Mars lost its atmosphere to space, and now we know that some of it ended up in Phobos. With a sample from the near side, we could see an archive of the past atmosphere of Mars in the shallow layers of grain. While deeper in the grain, we could see the primitive composition of Phobos. Phobos has always been a source of great controversy for scientists. Like its twin Deimos, there are many unresolved questions about where they came from. Some believe that they are large asteroids that got kicked out the main belt in the past and were captured by Martian gravity. Others have suggested that they formed from the same material as Mars, while still others theorise that they formed from debris resulting from a massive impact. Today, both of these satellites orbit their planet very closely and have very short orbital periods. Whereas Phobos, the closer of the two, takes just over seven and a half hours to complete an orbit, Deimos takes about 30 hours. In addition to their origin, there are also many questions regarding their history ever since they fell into orbit around Mars, as indicated by Phobos's many craters and the strange linear grooves. For years, scientists have been discussing whether samples obtained from the surface of Phobos could reveal information about early Mars. This practice, where moons are studied to learn more about a parent body, is a long-established tradition for planetary scientists and geologists. The Moon, for example, has provided scientists with a well-preserved record of Earth's distant past. During the Apollo era, astronauts back, brought back samples of lunar rocks that provided insight into the Moon's origin, evolution, and how smaller bodies distributed certain elements, like water, throughout the solar system during the late heavy bombardment. Because Phobos is tidally locked to Mars, the rocks on the near side of Phobos have been exposed to ionised atmospheric particles from Mars for millennia. Since September of 2014, MAVEN has been collecting data on the Martian atmosphere to help scientists determine how and when it was lost to space, as well as providing insights into the evolution of the planet's climate. Just a wee snippet for this one. Evidence is growing that there are reserves of water on the Moon, not just in the permanently shadowed crater of the Moon's poles, but across the surface, mixed in with the regolith. But how did it get there? A new idea proposes that the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere is depositing hydrogen atoms on the lunar surface. These are reacting with oxygen on the Moon, creating water. Budget constraints are a major consideration for every space programme throughout the world. Lately, NASA has taken a particularly bold approach by not only innovating through novel ideas that they could do great science, but also innovating with the way they fund these missions. A good example of this innovation is the Astrophysics Pioneers programme, which is a NASA funding programme targeted at early to mid-career researchers. The interesting thing about the programme is that the overall budget for each project 
is limited to 20 million dollars. Sounds like quite a lot of money to me, but quite small for a size project. Now the programme has selected its first four projects to move ahead to the second stage. The first project, called Aspera, which is the Latin for hard or difficult, would use ultraviolet light to study the intergalactic medium, the space in between galaxies that we know so very little about. Specifically, it would look for any hot gas that might be contained in that space. And while it's not known how or even if this hot gas interacts with the rest of the universe, data collected from Aspera could help us sort through the clouds of questions surrounding what exists in that space. Pandora is the second project, and will focus on studying the differences in measurements between exoplanet atmospheres and that of their stars. Specifically, it will take a deep dive into the 39 exoplanets surrounding 20 stars it will survey, with hope of disentangling the stars in planetary atmospheres. This data could provide a great boost to the search for habitable exoplanets, as observing their atmospheres is one of the best ways to determine whether an exoplanet is habitable or not. The third project, called Starburst, will monitor the skies for high energy gamma rays from events such as the merger of neutron stars. These events would be synchronised with the detection of simultaneous gravity waves in facilities such as LIGO, providing a multimodal methodology for monitoring these hugely destructive events. Starburst, led by Daniel Kozewski of NASA, hopes to enable simultaneous capture of up to 10 events a year, whereas only one has ever been successfully captured so far. I'm not sure how you pronounce this, I'll go for a PBO, or Payload for Ultra High Energy Observations. It's the fourth mission selected for further study, and it's different. Rather than requiring a satellite, it's actually a balloon launch mission. It will concentrate on attempting to detect ultra-high energy neutrinos, such as those created by newly formed black holes or merging neutron stars. NASA notes in their press release that none of these projects have yet been cleared for launch, and they'll require at least a year of further study before being reassessed for launch worthiness. Any technically successful project must also fit in the budget constraints of the Pioneers program. But luckily, researchers will be able to leverage plenty of novel commercially available hardware for CubeSats and other small satellites that wasn't available even a few years ago. That available infrastructure is one reason NASA now thought it would be a good time to launch the Pioneers program in the first place. There's a lot of people that are hoping they were right. So as always, thanks to the Universe Today people for the newsletter that I use for this. And that's the space news for tonight. So back to Alice Amanda. Right. Thanks very much, Roy. That was very interesting. Yes, a lot, a lot there to think about. Right. So, did anybody get any questions for Roy? No, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we'll move on to uh, tonight's speaker. Um. Right. Uh, David was a, is an honours, he's got an honours in physics and chemistry and a dip in education Newcastle. He was born in Darlington in 1941 and he moved to Hull from 46 to 67. He studied physics and chemistry at King's College, Newcastle, then part of Durham University followed by a one-year teaching diploma, Newcastle University, the year King's College became a university in its own right. He taught physics to A-level for three years at a comprehensive in Hull, then moved to Carlisle for the Lake District for walking and climbing. And he taught physics uh, two years in secondary school Carlisle Grammar becoming Trinity Comprehensive, plus four years at Carlisle Technical College as a lecturer too in physics, but taught science to a variety of trades as well as astronomy to O level. He returned to Trinity as head of physics and eventually electronics, introducing a new course, A level electronic systems. 
In the early 80s, he was a member of the fledgling Border Astronomical Society and ran the school astronomy group. In the late 1970s, Baz, with the help of the school and the technical college, began a project to build a 16-inch Newtonian reflector, an observatory, using a mirror built by Harry Clog Clogger? Clough. Clough, oh sorry, I like Ryan Clough, yeah. A member of the Scottish Astronomical Group, this was overseen by David, completed in 1986 and opened by Heather Cooper, president of the BAA. David is still the observatory manager, although he took early retirement from teaching in 1995 after publishing his first guidebook to the Lake District. From the late 70s to 2016, he was a volunteer trainer for the Duke of Edinburgh scheme at the school and still runs his own publishing business, P3 Publications, which has produced over 30 local books about Cumbria since 1993. David is married with two children, some grandchildren and two great grandchildren. So let's give David a warm welcome. Thank you. Can I share screen now? You should be yes. able to, yeah. Yeah, all right. So if I can find the right one here, because uh, I had it set up before. Where's it gone? Just a minute. I just have to find the screen. I'm sure it's not showing all the windows. I'll get it in a minute. If not, I'll have to load it again. And it's not there. I'll just load it again, just a minute. <clears throat> What's it for the screen? It should be there at the bottom. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Right. I'll just come back again. We got mute. We got muted. And just expand that again full screen and share screen. I should be able to find it now. There we are. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's it coming up now, David. Right oh, yeah. Slideshow from the beginning. That should be it. Correct right, in a minute. Right. Can you all see that? What is relativity? Yeah. Has everyone got the picture? Right. Well today I want to give you an introduction to Einstein's special relativity, which explains how space and time are linked for objects moving at a constant speed in a straight line. And we're going to start with some very simple but important ideas about how we see things. Several of the illustrations I use in this talk are from a Russian book entitled What is Relativity by Landau and Rummer. Now it was published in 1959 in Russian and 1960 in English. And I found it very useful when being introduced to the subject at university around that time. I will then move on to look at how, how do we interpret what we observe? And how do things move in reality? And this will bring us to ideas leading on to the principle of relativity of motion. And eventually something we call the tragedy of light. And eventually, after that, we should end up with a final theory with some practical examples of its use uh, in the real world. Okay, so that's the way I intend to go. So does every statement have a meaning? I mean, I could say, for example, this water is triangular, and that wouldn't make much sense, would it? A bit of nonsense. Um, however, if we look at this picture, for example, here, you could say on which side uh, on which side is the house to the left or to the right and um, if you weren't all muted you all tell me you can't tell it depends because one person is going one way and one the other you've got to take into account the direction <coughs> relative to which left and right is indicated we can say we walked on the right bank of the river for example 
because the current might determine the direction of the river. The notion's right and left are relative. The only acquire meaning after the direction relative to <coughs> which they are defined has been indicated. So, is it day or night just now? This question cannot be asked without indicating the point on the globe relative to which the question is being asked. Okay. And then we might say, who is bigger, the cow or the shepherd? Well, we would say the cow is bigger there, but of course, looking from a different viewpoint, the shepherd is bigger. And of course, again, we're looking at something that is relative because it's not the size of the object that matters, but it's the angle which the object makes with the eye. And this is why we get to see an eclipse where we know that the moon is an awful lot smaller than the sun, that we see an eclipse for the simple reason that they both subtend approximately the same angle uh, at the eye. Okay. Pretty simple ideas, but rather important to understand what we do a little, a little bit later on. So what about up and down? This chap here, he can understand that. He thinks that down is directly below him. The idea of a vertical. Are these notions absolute or are they relative? When we thought the Earth was flat, it was perfectly logical to have a vertical. Now we know it is a sphere or an oblate spheroid or whatever. The idea is suspect. This man also thinks that vertical is down below him. That's his vertical and this man as well. Okay. Um, so different points on the Earth will have different verticals. These motions are relative, not absolute. There's no unique vertical direction in the universe. Therefore, given any direction in space, we can find a point on the Earth surface at which this direction is vertical. Now, the same place or not? Um, <clears throat> Here's our Russian example. We're ascribing, we often say this event and that happened at the same place, ascribing absolute meaning to that statement. In truth, it has no meaning at all. It is no better than saying it is now five o'clock without saying whether it's five o'clock in Moscow or in Chicago. Now here we've got two lady passengers traveling from Moscow to Vladivostok. And they've agreed to meet every day during the journey at the same place in the train to write letters to their husbands. Would their husbands agree they had been meeting at one and the same place in space when they received letters from Yaroslav, from Perm, from Slodosk, etc. One and the same place from the viewpoint of the ladies is not the same for their husbands. Okay. <laughs> How does a body move in reality? So displacement of a body in space is also relative, not absolute. If you drop a stone from a flying plane, the person on the ground observing it, allowing for air friction, will see something like the curve like a parabola. Whereas the pilot sees the stone go vertically down beneath his plane. So again, we've got Relative to the plane, the stone, the stone falls in a straight line. Are all points of view equivalent? That's the next thing we look at. I've got to turn the page over here because we don't turn very well. If you go to a photographer for a passport picture, you naturally want him to photograph your face, not the back of your head. This demand determines the point in space from which the photographer must take the picture. Okay. All very simple ideas, but quite important. Rest is found. So an object on which the rest the motion of objects is influenced by external actions or forces, we call them. We may position ourselves in different ways to observe motion, 
and we'll just see it moving in different ways. The best position would be the one from which the object appears to be simply at rest. So an object on which no external forces act can be said to be at rest. So this is absolute rest. How does a body move in reality? If we imagine that we are at rest in our laboratory and we observe motion in another laboratory, then we can assert that the other laboratory is moving. Right. We are sitting in a train, running at constant speed in a straight line. Anything we observe in the train, such as throwing a ball in the air and catching it, is exactly the same as if we were at rest. Only things in the outside uh, change. If he looks outside when he gets further along, you notice that the view is different. So it is in a different laboratory to him, but in his laboratory, everything occurs as it would normally to him. What happens then if the train slows down quickly? Well, if it slows down quickly, forces act upon it. And the forces will act on anything loose in the train. And so if it slows down quickly, then you'll get that sort of result. What happens if the train turns a corner that doesn't change speed? It doesn't need not change speed, but it does change direction. And that points out, of course, that it's changing velocity. Velocity the speed in a definite direction, so that the book falls off the bunk when the train goes around the corner. So the principle then, the relativity of motion. In all laboratories moving in straight lines and uniformly with respect to each other, the motion of objects takes place according to the same laws. Okay. It follows from that principle that an object on which no external forces act can be not only in a state of rest, but also in a state of uniform straight line motion, like the chap in the train throwing the ball in the air. Speed is relative as well. Here we've got two spaceships. And the one at the top there, if you can't read it, it says, Are you going to float there all day? The staff traveler says. What do you mean, wise guy? I'm pushing 5,000 now. They're both going at the same speed. And as far as they are concerned, they are both, when they look at each other, they are both at rest. They are in the same laboratory. Same uniform motion in the straight line. The tragedy of light. Well, light travels at enormous speed. I'll just call it 300,000 kilometers per second because that makes it easy when we come to do one or two calculations a little bit later on. 300,000 kilometers per second, we'll say in a vacuum, but nevertheless, it's not instantaneous. That's the important thing. Can the speed of light be altered? Here, we've got a bullet going through a block of wax. And I think you'll all agree that the speed at which the bullet emerges from the block of wax is going to be less than the speed at which it entered because of the friction, frictional forces acting on it, slowing it down as it passes through. But what about light? Light can travel in different transparent mediums. And if we've got light and a prism, for example, we've got white light coming towards the prism, we will all be aware that when the light goes into the prism, it actually slows down. Does it travel at the speed of light in glass would be a different speed to what it is in a vacuum. 
So it slowed down. And because it's made up of different wavelengths, the different wavelengths actually are slowed down by different amounts. And so you get dispersion of the light. Um, the red end of the spectrum uh, being bent less as it changes speed as it goes into the, at an angle into the prism. If it was going perpendicular into the prism, it would not uh, split up like that. Um, just ignore that. My wife will answer it in a minute. Sorry, I'll just wait till it stops. Uh, she said she'd answer the phone if it ran. That's how she asked. <laughs> right. Uh, for those of you who possibly aren't sure why light bends, um, just imagine the tractor and the field effect. You know, a tractor traveling across um, across smooth surface, for example, if it's traveling in the direction, not at right angles to the surface it comes across, the wheel there at the top slows down before the other, and that causes it to slow round until all of the tracks, both tractor wheels are in the, on the grass, and then it will carry on, and when they get to the other side, it will slow back again the same amount. And that's exactly the same as how we envisage light behaving when we think of light as a wave motion. And the wave front is hitting the glass at an angle, about 45 degrees here. This part of the wave enters the glass first and slows down. So the whole wave front slows round and goes at the horizon in the glass in a different direction. But when it comes out, we notice with light, it slows back again to the same angle. In other words, the light speeds up to its original speed. And this is what is different about light to anything else, basically, to think about. The principle of relative motion appears to be shaken. Light has a constant velocity in the given medium. <coughs> So what is surprising about light is not its enormous speed, but the fact that it's always a constant speed. So here we've got Einstein's train. And because we're dealing with numbers which are very big, the speed of light is very fast. Then in order to make sense of it really, we've got to have a very big train. And the train has got to be moving very fast as well. So imagine we've got a train here moving at 240,000 kilometers to the right. And it's hit by simultaneous lightning flashes, <clears throat> one at each end of the train. Now the observer on the embankment, Mike, he's opposite the center of the train when that happens. And he sees simultaneous flashes as both flashes travel the same distance at the speed of light to reach him. Nina, however, sees the flash at the front of the train first. Light is traveling towards her from the front at 300,000 kilometers per second, but she is traveling towards the light at 240,000 kilometers per second. So light is approaching her at 540,000 kilometers per second. She's in a different frame of reference to Mike on the embankment, who sees simultaneous flashes. Okay. Now, well, I've put that down so you can read it in case you couldn't follow what I was saying. There it is. So, we now look at another example. Here we've got a light coming on in the middle of the train. We've still got to go in at 240,000 kilometers per second to the right. And the observer on the embankment is seeing what happens as well. Now he sees the light come on <coughs> as the middle of the train passes him. So he sees it there and then. But the other two see it at different times because the train is traveling at 240,000 kilometers a second that way. And the light is traveling that way as well at 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, but it's going back the same way there. So what is happening here?
she sees the uh, come on here. There we are. This is the one I should have on. <clears throat> He sees the flash at the same time, and they see the flash uh, at the same time, but at a different time to what he sees the flash. Because they are the same distance from the light bulb, and the light in that carriage is going to travel at the speed of light in that direction and in that direction. Have we got that right then? The speed of light is always. It's the same for both of them, and the distances are equal. All right, we haven't finished yet. Um, it was said at one time that light must have something to travel on. Everything else has something to travel on. Sound waves travel through the air. And what did light travel on? Of course, there's this idea of the ether. And the Michelson Morley experiment was an experiment. Similar to another experiment we want to mention later on, um, which tried to detect if there was in fact an ether, if there was in fact something on which the light travelled. Um, and this short video. As we help. move about the sun, and the sun moves about the universe, mm -hmm. our orientation and velocity must vary with respect to this proposed ether frame. This is the Michelson Morley experimental setup. It might travel the different speeds in different directions along paths of equal length. Then, when the beams from the two paths reunite, they will form an interference pattern. If, however, light travels at the same speed in all directions, no interference would be observed. In fact, no interference was observed, so no ether frame exists. Let's assume the ether frame moves relative to the Earth from left to right. Michelson Morley used a half silvered mirror to split a beam of light so that it travels in two different directions along two paths of equal length. This is the light beam before it is split. Moving in a perpendicular direction to the ether frame, this beam would be blown off course and would have to travel a little further. Traveling back down this path again, perpendicular to the ether, would also move this beam off course if the ether existed. This beam moving parallel to the ether and in the same direction would increase its speed. This beam again parallel to the ether but moving in the opposite direction would be slowed down. Here the two light beams are recombined together and if they are in phase, they will constructively interfere. But if the speed was different in the two paths, they would combine to give an interference pattern. The time for the trip back and forth along the path for the beam perpendicular to the ether frame would be given by this expression, which just makes use of Pythagoras' theorem. If the distance between the half silvered mirror and the reflecting mirrors is d, then the time of the trip for the beam moving parallel to the ether frame would be given by the expression shown here. If an ether frame existed, then the time difference along the two paths is just given by the expression shown here. This is a large enough difference with the speed of the Earth being 28.8 .8 kilometers per second to be detected. The experiment failed to detect any difference in time along the two paths. They even waited for six months and repeated the experiment with the same result. This failure of their experiment allowed us to conclude that <clears throat> light did not travel on any medium at all, and it always traveled in a vacuum at that speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. So, what are Einstein's postulates then for the special theory of relativity? The ether cannot be detected. The velocity of light is always constant relative to an observer. So those were his two postulates from which the rest of this theory eventually came. So the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers 
second in all laboratory. Now, medieval man thought the Earth was flat as objects fell down to Earth. But when we understand the force of gravity, or when we understood the force of gravity, we can reconcile that the Earth can be spherical and we will not fall off it. This is what we just showed before. So we call that common sense. And it represents nothing but a generalization of the notion of habits we've grown up with. We assumed previously that two simultaneous events were simultaneous in any laboratory and experiment has shown that it's not true. <clears throat> we cannot observe the happenings described in our thought experiments, but we can carry out experiments to show that they happen in many physical phenomena. Thus the words, common sense, the words at one and the same time, and the words at one and the same place, are meaningless. Okay. So, time is relative, in other words. So let's see if we can show that. Clocks and rulers play tricks. Ahead of us is a very long railway line with Einstein's train <coughs> moving along it. At a distance of 864 million kilometers from each other are two stations. At its speed of 240,000 kilometers per second, Einstein's train needs one hour to cover this distance. There's a clock at each station. A passenger boards the train at the first station and sets his watch by the station clock only to find that when he arrives at the second station, his watch is slow. A watchmaker tells him there's nothing wrong with your watch. To help us understand this, imagine the passenger directs a beam of light from a torch fixed to the floor onto a mirror on the ceiling, which then reflects, reflects back to the torch. So he is traveling, he's seen by the passenger. He sees the light go up to the ceiling and come back down again. Meanwhile, the person on the platform, as the train passes, sees the light go up, that the train is traveling forward to A to B, and then down B to C. And he notes a time of 10 seconds for that to happen. Okay. How do we get these? So we've got 240,000 kilometers per second the train is traveling at. Let us assume the observer of the platform established 10 seconds, as we just said before, elapsed between the departure of the ray and its return. So it went up there and down there in 10 seconds as the train went uh, along its journey. Okay. In 10 seconds, it traversed 300,000 speed of light times 10, 3 million kilometers. Therefore, AB and BC must be 3 million divided by 2, 1,500,000 uh, 1, kilometers long each. So we know the length of that side of the triangle. Okay. The side AC is obviously the distance traveled by the train in 10 seconds. And it was going at 240,000 kilometers per second. So the side AC is 2,400,000 kilometers, 10 times 240,000. So we know the length of that, and we know the length of that. So that half of that will give us the length CD. So the height of the carriage using Pythagoras' theorem, which I think all of us must know, must be BD. The light went up to the ceiling of the carriage and came back down again. And that BD is BD squared is AB squared minus AD squared. That's just Pythagoras' theorem. And it gives us a result of that lot, that squared minus that squared 
which equals 900,000 kilometers, and traveling at the speed of light, 900,000 divided by the speed of light, it will give you only six seconds. So we've shown that at the very high speed, that person on the train, his clock will, slow, will only register six seconds when the person on the platform registers 10 seconds. And this is how we show that time is relative, as well as other things. And Einstein put that into, his, into an equation, uh, which is the time seen by the person in the uh, traveling in the train there, is the time seen by the person on the platform, square root of one minus e squared, which is adapting that uh, <coughs> Pythagoras' theorem to, to the basic equation, and comes up with the answer six seconds. So, time taken for light to travel to the ceiling and back on the train is six seconds. Time taken for light to travel to the ceiling and back on the ceiling to the platform, 10 seconds. The ratio of the times is six over 10. So, according to station time, the train arrived an hour after its departure, the time elapsed on the passenger's watch would only be six tenths of one hour, which is 36 minutes. And that is why his watch was running slow. So, further increase in speed of the train will, of course, <coughs> cause a further slowing down of the passenger's watch. So what about a journey to a star? Right, here we've got two twins. We've got Blair, who's uh, two, two twins. We've got twins. Blair is 20 and Aiden is 20. When Blair remains on Earth, home on Earth for 60 years, during which traveling twin, twin Aiden averages 87% of the speed of light, a speed where aging is actually hard. You can check that, but it, it's true. So Aiden slingshots around a neutron star or a black hole and comes back. When he gets half to the halfway point, um, Blair is only 50 years old because it's taken uh, 20, it's, it's taken 30 years to get there. But Aiden is 20 plus 15 because time is only going at half the speed for him. So he's 35 at halfway point. And after 60 Earth years, Blair is 20 plus 60 is 80. But Aiden is only 20 plus 30 is 50. So, it looks as if time travel is possible, doesn't it? Would this time machine work in reality? Time of travel, this is the gain in time you get. Six months, you gain six weeks. One year, you gain 18 months. Two years, you gain 28 years. Three years, you gain 360 years. So it's beginning to look quite possible, isn't it? That you've got to consider other things. We were talking about sending the human body all the way there and all the way back. Um, well, this is what we get to that. Yes, maybe this is best done with your subject as follows. Just a bit of line here. There once was a lady called Bright who could travel faster than light. She went out one day in a relative way and came back the previous night. Right. What about the energy consumption? It's traveling in a rocket. Rockets weigh a lot, but we'll take a very modest rocket, one ton rocket. Okay. The amount of energy needed to do that would be that number of kilowatt hours, which is as much energy as produced in the Earth uh, in seven months. In other words, you need, you need that to get it, get it up there, that's the end of the consumption to get there. And to slow down on the way back, you, use, you need to use exactly the same amount as well. Um, and this was, that's the speed needed to double time so that for each year that elapses in the rocket, two years to elapse on Earth, 250 million uh, kilowatt hours. So at the end of the flight, you've used twice that amount. Okay. 
the speeds of actual rocket jets are tens of thousands of times smaller than the speed of light. So time flows at different rates, time dilation effect. Time flows at different rates for different events. Two observers moving at a constant velocity relative to each other. It appears to each that the other's time processes are slowed down. Time flows at different rates for two observers moving relative to each other. Observers not moving relative to one another. Well, here we've got the Earth and here we've got Aldebaran. And there's a supernova occurs. Um, the Beetlejuice, for example, it blows up. <coughs> March 17th, 2013, it happened. Um, 2220, March 17th, 2280, <coughs> 250 light years from Beetlejuice on Aldebaran. It is seen by, by an inhabitant of Aldebaran. On Earth, the person sees it 300 light years later, March the 17th, 2330. So this single event is not simultaneous for all places. So time must be included in equation as well as the three dimensions of space. So that's what that tells you. Is anything else affected? Well, yes. If these two people are traveling again like this, the star explodes, neither A or B are aware that the star has exploded since the light waves haven't reached them yet. <clears throat> a short time later, the light waves reach A and B. Excuse me, I must have a But when they do, A and B will be separated by the distance X because they are moving relative to each other. So, for A, speed of light is C, the speed of light is C dash for B, but we know that B equals CT, the distance there, the speed of light travels for that person and for this person travels at the same speed. So C dash is basically C. So D is CT, D dash is CT, that's okay, C T dash. So that T dash over T is T dash over D, which is the speed of light. As T over T equals C, and D dash over T dash equals C. That's the idea. Explain it. Now, according to Einstein, then if A could measure the length of B's spaceship, you would get an answer using these ratios, in, in same as these ratios, the distances. So you can do, this is what you get, um, Einstein's equation for the time difference, but it applies also to length. So the nearer you get to the speed of light, the bigger you get, uh, the smaller you get, right? And also, you see, you can put it in here. If, um, if we go back to that diagram, 50 <coughs> time, 50, say, 50, 50 meters here against 30 meters. So, in one spaceship, looking at the other one, he thinks season has been 30 meters long, not 50 meters long. And if the other one looks back at him, he sees he gets exactly the same answer. So, length is, a is affected as well. There was a young fellow named this who was fencing with his sleeping numerous. So a person with his action with his general contraction reduced his rapier to a bit. So length and time are relative. Now, mass is also affected. Let's do it for mass. We've got a hundred kilogram runner. He's trying to lose weight. All right. He's traveling at five meters per second. All right. So his new mass will be his old mass over one minus his speed, five meters per second squared over his velocity of light squared. All right, gives that answer there. 
And the answer is, he increases his mass by one ten thousandth of hundred thousandth of a kilogram. Mass increases with speed. And that's how much the mass would increase if you're traveling at five meters per second. So the equivalence of mass and energy. Well, we've all heard of it. E equals mc squared. And this is what and this is what Einstein came up with as a result of his investigation. And of course, we know it works. We've got nuclear weapons, for example, uh, and the uh, radioactivity in, in occurring in the Earth. What evidence then do we have for special relativity? Nuclear weapons is one. Mass increase with velocity, theta particle, it's mass increase with its speed. Time dilation, Ives experiment, measured frequency of vibration of hydrogen atoms when at rest, and when accelerated by an electric field, the point 006 times the speed of light, the frequency de decreased by the predicted amount. And more recently, of course, it's become ever more important um, since we've got things like GPS. Because for your car's GPS navigation to function as accurately as it does, satellites have to take relativistic effects into account. This is because even though satellites aren't moving at anything close to the speed of light, they are still going pretty fast. The satellites are also sending signals to ground stations on Earth. These stations and the GPS unit in your car are all experiencing higher accelerations due to gravity than the satellites in orbit. To get that pinpoint accuracy, the satellites use clocks that are accurate to a few billionths of a second, nanosecond, since each satellite is 12,600 miles above, or 20,300 kilometers above the Earth, and moves at about 6, 000, uh, 10,000 kilometers per hour, there's a relativistic time dilation that tacks on about four microseconds each day. Adding the effects of gravity, and the figure goes up to about seven microseconds. That's 7,000 nanoseconds. The satellite clocks are moving at 14,000 kilometers per hour in orbits that circle the Earth twice per day, much faster than clocks on the surface of the Earth. Einstein's theory of special relativity says that rapidly moving clocks tick more slowly by about seven microseconds per day. The difference is very real. If no relativistic effects were accounted for, a GPS unit that tells you it's a half mile to the next filling station would be five miles off after only one day. So that's the, how important it is that you understand and you're able to uh, put corrections into these computers in the GPS system to correct those effects. Um, Another more at home one, um, your old television. Just a few years ago, most televisions and monitors had cathode ray tubes. Um, and the cathode ray tube works by firing electrons at a fossil surface with a big magnet. Each electron makes a lighted pixel when it hits back at the back of the screen. The electrons fired out to make the picture move at up to 30% the speed of light. Electrons are very, very light and they're very easy to accelerate. Relativistic effects are noticeable, and when manufacturers shape the magnets, they have to take those effects into account so that the picture you got on the screen wasn't distorted uh, as a result. Okay. Now, the muon. Um, <clears throat> the muon is an electron, basically, it's got a charge, but it's got a much bigger mass. Than the electron. The reason it's got a much bigger mass, it's traveling very fast. And muons um, have been detected on the Earth's surface. Um, at 10 kilometers height, you can measure the flux coming from outer space of muons. And you might be counting um, a million particles at 10 kilometers high. How many will reach the Earth? Now, these, they don't last that long. They've got a very short half-life. Their half-life is 1.56 millionths of a second. Uh, and so if you work it out using the half-life 
and work out how many half lights you've gone through and coming down that distance at the speed they're going, you get an answer that only about 0.3 out of a million should be detected on the Earth's surface. But in actual fact, we detect about 49,000 of that million on the Earth's surface. And the reason is that time is slowed down to that muon. So that if it doesn't go through 28 half lives on its way down, it only goes through about 4.36 half lives. And as a result, there's more left when for our meters to detect on Earth. So that's a direct effect of Einstein's theory. The moon's clock is time dilated, so they live longer. Their half-life is uh, effectively a bit longer. And uh, you detect a lot more than you would expect. So Einstein's theory actually showed a lot of these things uh, to be true. Now, um, <clears throat> one, one of the main things, I said I'd show examples of astronomy, but most of the examples in astronomy actually support uh, uh, to show, show that general relativity, the more general relativity rather than the special relativity, um, which talks about objects moving at constant speed in a uh, constant speed in a particular laboratory. And when you look at the general relativity, Einstein predicted a lot of things. And he, what he, one thing he predicted, of course, was gravitational waves. And they haven't been detected until several years ago. And we had a talk recently. I, I, I looked back to find it. I don't know whether it was one another society did um, about the laser interferometer gravitational, ra gravitational wave observatories. There's two or three of these around the world. And a few years ago, they detected the first gravitational wave um, and that as a result of that uh, it, they proved that Einstein had been uh, correct there and it's very like the Mittelson interferometer in that they have at right angles um, two long uh, tunnels along which uh, they can fire particles and the uh, well, I'll put, show you the easiest way is to show you a little video about it, rather than to rapidly describe. This is the sound of two black holes colliding and merging. Where did this sound come from? A long time ago, in the distant reaches of the universe, two black holes, each about 30 times as massive as our sun, were locked in orbit and spiraling away towards each other. The only visible traces of the spinning cataclysm would have been the way their gravitational fields warped the light of the distant stars. Even as they collided and merged, there wasn't a flicker of light to be seen. The real and very violent action of the system was in the form of gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space. These waves were constantly draining energy from the black hole, but speeding to their ultimate collision and merging to form a single black hole. At that instant, the power of the gravitational waves was 50 times greater than that of all the stars in the universe combined. That pulse of gravitational waves, lasting only a fraction of a second, expanded through the universe, passing unimpeded through countless galaxies. About 1.3 billion years later, it reached Earth. Gravitational waves alternately stretch and squeeze space itself. Everything they pass through, but the effect is minuscule. Their effect on Earth here has been vastly exaggerated to help visualize something that is otherwise invisible on the scale. To detect them and directly measure their properties, scientists built LIGO, the most sensitive measuring device ever made. LIGO uses a device known as an interferometer to measure the tiny displacements in space. In this simplified representation, a laser beam is sent towards a partially reflecting mirror and split along two paths. The beams travel along the four kilometer arms and reflect back towards the central mirror, which recombines them, directing their light to the as the gravitational waves pass, the distance between the central beam splitter and the end mirror stretches along one arm and presses along the other. This changes the time it takes the light to travel along the arms. The recombined light waves shift with respect to one another and produce a signal. Incredibly tiny stretching and squeezing of space can actually be measured directly in this way. How little does space distort to make this signal? Let's zoom into a hydrogen atom until we reach the proton. 
Pago is so sensitive that it can measure changes in distance as tiny as a thousandth the diameter of a person. And this tiny measurement made by LIGO was the final step in a journey that began 1.3 billion years ago in the distant universe where two black holes collide. Two observatories at the same time detected that. And um, that's about 2017. We did have a talk on it. I, I, some of you were there, I know, but uh, I remember it. Not so long ago. Now, experimental evidence then for general relativity. Well, <clears throat> this is one of them, in that um, it was predicted um, by the English astronomer Arthur Eddington in 19. Uh, just after Einstein predicted that light rays were bent near a massive body, Arthur Eddington considered that uh, it could be verified by carefully comparing star positions in images of the sun taken during the solar eclipse. Um, and in 1919, an excellent opportunity presented itself in an especially long total solar eclipse in the vicinity of the bright Hyades star cluster, visible from north and northern Brazil to the African coast. And he led one ex expedition to Principe, an island off the African coast. And Andrew Crumlin of the Royal Greenwich Observatory led a second expedition to the Bra in Brazil. And after carefully comparing photographs from both expeditions with the reference photographs of the Hyades, Eddington declared that the starlight had been deflected about 1.75 seconds of arc, as predicted by general relativity. So the gravitational pull of the sun had deflected the starlight and this was the uh, that was who way back um, by Eddington at that time and the same effect of course uh, works with Hubble pictures um, we get what we call gravitational lensing where a massive cosmic object focuses light from another object beyond it to produce a distorted or magnified image and um, this one in particular by Hubble, which shows you on here, you're getting five images uh, of five, uh, five images which are produced from the original, which I think is about this one here, that these are all due to gravitational distortions from a massive black hole in, at the back. Um, the background quiz, this quiz I'm talking about, so, <coughs> The background quasar is a brilliant core of a galaxy it's powered by a black hole, which is devouring gas and dust and creating a gusher of light in the quasar. When the quasar's light passes through the gravity field of the galaxy cluster that lie between us and the quasar, the light is bent by the space warping gravity field in such a way that five separate images are produced surrounding the cluster of the same thing around here. And um, there are other objects on there which are reproduced more than once. So looking at that carefully, Hubble and comparing with what the, the pictures we've got previously, um, it's possible to show that this gravitational effect is taking place. Just uh, to finish off, just um, a few more examples. Um, what about gold? Why is gold golden in color? Well, gold is a heavy atom. Uh, why is it yellow? Most metals are shiny because the electrons in the atoms jump from different energy levels or orbitals. Some photons that hit the metal get absorbed and re-emitted, though at a longer wavelength. Most visible light, though, just gets reflected. Gold is because it's so heavy. The inner electrons are moving fast enough that the relativistic mass increases significant, as well as the length contraction. As a result, the electrons are spinning around the nucleus in shorter paths with more momentum. And electrons in the inner orbitals carry energy that is closer to the energy of outer electrons. And the wavelengths that get absorbed and reflected are longer. So longer wavelengths of light mean that some of the visible light that would usually just be reflected gets absorbed and that light is in the blue end of the spectrum, that particular light, 
So white light is a mix of all the colors of the rainbow, but in Gore's case, when light gets absorbed and re-emitted, the wavelengths are usually longer. This means the mix of the light waves we see tends to have less blue and violet in it. This makes gold appear yellowish in color, since yellow, orange, and red light is a, have a longer wavelength than blue. So Einstein's relativity, you can explain the color of gold. Um, similar thing, mercury is also a heavy atom with electrons held close to the nuclear because of their speed and consequent mass increase. With mercury, the bonds between its atoms are weak, so mercury melts at lower temperatures and is typically a liquid when we see it. Um, so again, relativistic effects affect the appearance and the behavior of mercury. Uh, there's a lot more examples. We go on, if you look, look online, you find an awful lot more. But I think I will uh, leave it at that first. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, David. It was really interesting. I mean, I've done um, mm -hmm. understanding space and time. I've done general and special relativity, but that was many years ago. But uh, and these talks always jog my memory for, for stuff I learned back then. <laughs> I don't think anybody's got, got any questions. I mean, I've, I've tried to make it as simple as possible at the beginning, but you always got to come to some maths at some stage. But it's quite good that you don't need any maths more than Pythagoras, really. No. Yeah. For the initial is, ideas. Is there any questions for, for David? Uh, not really a question, but it's just one of these things I can never understand. If you have two mass accelerators, uh, one's working anti-clockwise and one's working clockwise, and then the output from those accelerators, you know, that normally speeds atoms up to just under the speed of light. So if you've got one coming anti-clockwise, another one produced clockwise, their approaching speed would be almost twice the speed of light. Of course, you can't have that. So I presume it's a, from each particle's point of view, <laughs> they're still the just approaching at the speed of light. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but, um, the, I mean, the, the this is quite heavy part. This is how they, how, the, how they find these new particles, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that, this is the method they use. Um, yes, I would think that's why it depends where you're looking from. If you're in a, you're in outer frame, if you're in the uh, watch watching it, not that you can see it happen um, from outside, then you see one going one way at the speed of light and one going the other way at the speed of light. But uh, as far as uh, if there's no the, the, there's no sentient being in the particle itself to detect the speed it thinks it's going at. It's <laughs> strange. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's the whole point of um, that you know, Einstein realized that time was relative and you can show it with practical things in the earth. It's just as well that it was, we would not, not have got a lot of the modern equipment we've got now working as it does if we didn't understand that. That, that, time, uh, that time and length and mass um, are all, all changed with speed, but it's only Newtonian mechanics only works basically at, at, at low speed, at, at low velocity. Um, I, I, I think it's fascinating, but every time I do it, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, <laughs> you've got to think about it every time. Um, any other questions? Not so much a question, it's just a comment again. Um, the thing I always remember is that it takes light a nanosecond to go the length of a plastic ruler. <laughs> I was taught that when we worked on high speed logic circuits in the 1980s, yeah. because it all gets important in the circuit board. But a plastic ruler is a na light nanosecond long, so if you get a billion of them, you can have a light second. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I I taught air level physics. We did the Nuffield course for many years at Trinity School. And 
there's experiments on that course where you measured the speed of light. You know, using modern electronics, it, it, it's you can do it. Uh, you can get time differences which you can which, which you can measure, and the uh, youngsters were able to do this in the sixth form. I actually, can't do the experiments now, but, we, but but look on the old Nuffield course for the time course experiments there, and the equipment to do it. Mm -hmm. If you, if you look on the internet, it tells you how to do it with a microwave, of course, and a bar of chocolate. Yeah, yeah. But of course, in some extent, I don't believe that because you know the frequency length relationship because you know the velocity of light. So I'm not actually sure you're measuring the, the length of the, the velocity of light. But it's a good way of either ruining your microwave or having liquid chocolate for tea. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, um, when you start looking, uh, I, I was just reading a book, I've, I've passed it on to my friend now on precision. Um, and it shows how, you know, right from we, when they started um, mass manufacturing things like motor cars, um, before they mass manufactured, everyone was made individually and every little part had to be made to fit. Uh, then when you came to something went wrong, something broke down, you, you couldn't just get a replacement part that would fit in and go into the same and replace it. And it was when Ford came along with his Model T Ford and started doing that sort of thing. And the, the precision got better and better and better. Uh, and this has gone on right the way through. Until nowadays, uh, with your lithography and producing printed circuits, I mean, the only... I remember using transistors before the first printed circuits, you know, when I was at university. And um, you're getting now on these little pieces uh, that go inside your smartwatch or go inside your phone, you're getting millions of transistors, working transistors, and the things actually work. And it's, it's lithography on, on, onto the silicon or whatever. And it's got to be so precise. And it works, and uh, we've got them all over now. Everything, you know, I've got a smartwatch on here now, I, I've got a mobile phone, and then millions and billions of transistors in these things. And they're getting now down to the stage where they're down to the atomic size, and they're going to have to look for new materials to get smaller and using less and less of energy, energy of course, as well. Pixels in your in your mobile phone, of course, are getting close to the size of light of the wavelength of light now. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just uh, it's staggering, really, and it makes you wonder where, where it'll all end. But precision started uh, way back uh, in well, way back with things uh, when we see the maritime making the the blocks of the ships, eighteenth um, century. Uh, and initially blocks were made individually and if a block broke on the ship they could not easily replace it with one that would work the same uh, and then they started they, they developed a way of making blocks all the same which were identical which were interchangeable so it didn't matter what ship you were on you had a certain size of block and it would fit and it would work and that was one of the first examples of precision uh, and the other thing was drilling cannons as well um, they decided when they started to, uh, instead of casting cannons, to cast a solid iron block and drill out the bore of the cannon. And they developed that to a high precision so that it would, it would fit or any ball that was put into it, basically. But you could interchange the barrels of the cannons or, and the guns eventually. That is a fascinating book. So. <coughs> And all, this, all of this has happened in the last 50 odd years. Hasn't it? The, the development has been ridiculously fast in the last 50 years in terms of what we've seen happen in electronics in particular. And I remember the, I remember the old um, first car I had, side valve Ford, grinding the valves, putting new bits and rings in. Nowadays, you get a car and it just runs and runs and runs. And you have got a diesel at the moment that's uh, 120,000. It runs as smoothly as it did when it first got it, you know. Boom. 
because of the precision of the uh, of the parts that they're, uh, they're going to. You don't get the uh, growth, you don't get your back end, the, what it be? the soft white metal in the bottom of the pistons, you don't get that breaking up now as you used to. Right. Any other questions or comments? Or... Right. I think that's uh, everybody asked what they the wanted to ask. So that was a really excellent, excellent talk. And there's been uh, comments on the, the chat as well, how interesting the talk was and what a great talk and that. So and people have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so I'd like us to thank David in the usual way. Yeah. It's a pleasure doing it. Yeah. It's a long time since I've given a talk because we haven't been working live for such a long time. Yeah. Hi, Bob. <laughs> okay, just quickly, shall I just stop the recording now then? I just stop the recording now. Chit chat. Okay. Right.